If you want to turn your Bibles over to the book of Esther, we're going to spend the majority of our time and probably most of our time here. Uh, Laura and I were talking about this the other day, that a lot of times it's easy for, for a preacher or a teacher to focus on doctrine and teachings and, and exegesis and explaining passages and, and matters of, and, and all those things. And, and those are good things to do. We, we need to be focused on those. That's a big part of what we do. Uh, anytime we teach the gospel, anytime we teach from the Bible, we're trying to help people to understand what God wants from us. But it's easy for us, I think, sometimes to neglect one of the powerful, one of the most powerful tools that the Bible has to offer for us, and that is the power of storytelling. The idea that the Bible, in, in so many ways, particularly in the Old Testament, teaches us through narrative. It shows men and women who are called by God and placed in certain situations. And we learn not so much from the scriptures telling us that what they did was right or wrong, but from looking at not only how they responded to their situations, how their faith motivated them, but how God works through them to try to accomplish his will. And I think the book of Esther may be one of the great examples of that concept. We see a story of essentially two people. You know, we call it the book of Esther. Quite frankly, it could be the book of Mordecai just as easily. Uh, if you really want to stretch it, you could even argue that it's the book of Annie because we learn from all three of those characters. And, and the way that they live and interact and the way that God works through them. But we see, I, I think, some great examples of what it means to live a life in faith and what it means to risk something for the cause of, of God. And in our case, of course, the cause of Christ. And we, we live in a very different culture, obviously, than they lived. But I think it's, there's a lot of things that are useful for us as we'll talk about it a little bit later, the fact that in a lot of ways, these people were responding to their faith in much the same way that we do today. Um, they're responding not based on what they can see, but on what they trust. So as we talk about this book, I'm gonna go through and we'll, we'll spend most of our time reading sections of this and I'm gonna give some background and we'll make some observations as we go through uh, and, and continue on. And then we'll make a couple of points to, to close out the lesson. Uh, it's a little bit of a different, tactic than I normally use, so if you'll bear with me a little bit, I, something I, want, I need to do more of and want to do more of, so I hope I'll get better at it. But as we read the story of Esther, just to set some background, this book takes place under the reign of a king that is called Ahasuerus uh, in the scriptures. We would know him better as Xerxes. Uh, that's typically how he's seen in, in, uh, in history. And the story takes place beginning in the year 483 BC. Uh, the, we know that the first wave of Jewish exiles have now gone back to Jerusalem, led by Zerubbabel and Joshua the priest. The temple has been completed uh, around 515 BC. In fact, I think exactly 515 BC. Uh, so we're more than 40 years removed from the decree of Cyrus and still 45 more years before Ezra, Ezra is going to bring a second remnant back into Jerusalem. So the call of God has gone out. The people have begun to go back, but they're still a lot of attachment to the civilization in which they live. You know, these were people who have been living in Babylonian captivity for some 70 years. And of course, now it's the Medes and Persians who have taken over and, and conquered the Babylonians. It, but we see a lot of Jews that are still in these areas and are continuing, at one point were prominent in Babylonian society, and now are going to be prominent in, in uh, Medo-Persian society. And so with that context, we do see this story beginning in the capital city of this empire, uh, the, the city of Susa. It's under the Persian Empire. With Xerxes, as we know historically, preparing for an invasion of Greece. Uh, history tells us that he may have spent as much as three years, the first three years of his reign, preparing this attack. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty evident for the most part that when we read what's going on in this first chapter, he, he's throwing this 180-day feast for the king's host. Uh, it's very likely that this is a part of that preparation. And again, this may very well be, as you read the book of Esther, it's hard not to pick up on the idea that much of the writing appears to be, uh, I wouldn't say embellished, but maybe exaggerated at some point to make a point. Uh, uh, there may be a little bit of uh, a, a storytelling license taking place. Uh, and 
it's possible that 180 days may have simply been a reference to the fact that this was a, an over-the-top celebration that he did. The, the days are really the, the, the important point. The important thing is that we see a king here is very much about celebrating and, and, and being lavish and, and showing off what he has, very much as we saw with the Babylonians. You know, there's a, there's a theme that goes through the books of Daniel and, and Ezra and Nehemiah and Ezra as we see get glimpses into these pagan kings, we start to see themes of drunkenness. We start to see themes of uh, pride and arrogance. We start to see themes of impetuous decisions. We see this happening over and over again, and it goes throughout the book of Esther. Uh, and so we see Xerxes, or has an eros, Xerxes is much easier to say, I'm just calling Xerxes. Uh, in the midst of this, and after the 180 days, we read that he has a smaller seven-day celebration in the palace. I would assume this is probably for a smaller group, but it's still his, 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 his officials and those of the kingdom that were of some important. And it's in the midst of this celebration that we're told in chapter one that it has an eros feeling merry from the wine. Uh, calls for the queen who was holding her own celebration feast for the women in another part of the palace. And we're not told whether there was something more that is implied here. There's a lot of speculation going on. We're, we're told down in verse 11 that he gives the command to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. Now, whatever was implied there, we, we don't really know, but what we do know is the queen refused to obey. And we're not told why, but you can imagine that, you know, the king and his friends have been drinking for seven days and he wants, he wants her now to come and parade in front of her. And it's very likely that she said, I'm not going to do that. And as a result of that, we see the, the king becoming infuriated and his advisors being infuriated, but also warning him something. And, it, you know, this is, I think, an interesting point that we don't really talk about a lot, uh, but I think it's important for the, the context of the story because notice what they tell him. Um, in verse 17, they say, for the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. You know, the idea that we need to make sure that the women are kept in their place. We need to make sure that there's an example set, because we can't have women uh, refusing to do whatever their master or their husband commands. And that's really the attitude in which this story takes place. I have to remember sometimes, and this is a little bit of an aside, I thought about making this part of this lesson about this, but it was going to get way too long. But I'll just make this point that we, we often hear a lot of times of the Bible and of the, of the, especially in the New Testament, we read about the, the different roles of men and women and how women are considered to be somehow inferior, or somehow subjugated in a lot of ways. That's the attitude that we see from Hasmerus. And that's what we see in the Persian Empire, the concern that they had that we need to make sure that our wives are in subjection to us and we don't want them to, to, to ever think that they can have a voice of their own. That's not the Bible. We know that that's not the Bible picture of, of men and women. We, we understand that there are roles of headship and that wives are to submit themselves to their husbands. But what we're seeing here is the idea of the men using that mandate as a license to basically be a ruler, to hold sway in whatever they decided to do, and that my wife is there specifically to do whatever I tell her to do. And then if I say jump, she has to ask how, answer how high. And that anything, any resistance, any, 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 response on her part would be seen as a rebellion. That's not the Bible attitude. And I hope we understand that. And I hope we see that, that what we're getting an example of here is how the Bible and how God's word elevates men and women out of that attitude. It ought to bring us into an, a, a, an attitude of mutual respect and mutual love and mutual service that, that is not found outside of God's word. That's, anyway, that's my five minutes on that. We'll maybe more later on. But, but the idea here, again, we see the contempt under which Esther lives in, in, a, in a culture that really has a lot of contempt for women. And she's going to have to navigate in that context, which in a lot of ways makes what she does all the more impressive. And we're introduced here to this concept of the law of the Medes and Persians, because what, do they, do, what they do is they tell him uh, in verse 19, if it please the king, let a royal order go out from him. From him. Let it be written among the laws, the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Asher. So she's, she's going to be banished as a result of what she did. Uh, and, and again, as another side, critics of this book and other books will come back and say, well, there, there's no such thing as this idea that the laws of the Medes, of the Medes and the Persians could not be repealed. That, that wasn't a thing. But what we do see, and I think you see this in the attitude not only of the Hasmerus, but the attitudes of Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar and all the kings that we read about, 
is an arrogance that says, I'm king and I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and I will never repent of that. I will never change my mind of that. And I'm not going to show any example of me acknowledging that what I did was wrong. Remember, when it's a great example. It's kind of like when Darius has Daniel thrown into the lion's den because, I look, I made a command. I can't go back on that. I cannot lose face. What I can do is add to that command and say, and furthermore. So it's almost, that's kind of the pattern that we start to see, and we'll see it in the book of Esther. Uh, I don't think it's so much that, the, that it was impossible for these laws to be repealed. It says, as king, I'm not going to repeal it. It would be beneath my station as king. And so we're introduced to that mindset as well as we go through the story. And, and as the writer continues to build uh, kind of a framework for what we're going to be talking about, so Vashti's going to be banished, and we read in chapter 2 that sometime later, uh, he, the king remembers the, the, the queen Vashti. Again, we're not, whether it's, it, it almost sounds like he may have missed the queen, or he may have missed the concept of having a queen. And, and this is, a, by the way, another instance that lines up a little bit historically, because what we know is that after this time of feasting, after this time of preparation, uh, Xerxes went off on a crusade against the Greeks that, went well for a while, but he was finally defeated. And it's, that, it's, um, it's about probably after about three years later, I believe, that he returns to, to his kingdom. And we wonder, well, why does it take so long for him to get back to this question of having a queen? And the answer is because he was off fighting the Greeks. So now he comes back and, and he's regrouping and he's recovering and he remembers that, oh, by the way, it was pretty nice to have a queen. And so his, 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 his uh, advisors advise him, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you go out and send out throughout all the kingdom and find all the, the beautiful young women that are in your kingdom and bring them together. Again, this goes back to that culture that we were talking about. I'm going to take every one of these women that has any value, I'm going to bring them and take them to my, in my harem. And how this is going to work is I'm going to see each one of them individually, one by one, and the one that I like best, I'm going to name queen. Now, all the rest of them get to go back into my harem, and they will, there they will stay for the rest of their lives. And they'll likely never see the king. And they're basically condemned to a life of living in the palace with, with no purpose other than to just be there. Again, that's the, the way, the disposable nature in which this, this culture viewed, uh, viewed women. And as a result of that, in verse 5 through 10 of chapter 2, if you want to read along, we're introduced to Mordecai and Esther. And it says in verse 5, Now there was a Jew in Susa, a citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up to Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had, for she had, um, lost my place, for she, excuse me, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king ordered and his edicts were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel in custody of, of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his, and the young woman pleased him and, and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known to her people, uh, her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. So we, we learn from these things about a couple of things. And we focus a lot of times on the details of Esther, and we'll talk about Esther as well. But I want to start by looking at what we learn about this man named Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai ends up, as I said, quite possibly could be the focus of this book in a lot of ways. Uh, he's described as a Benjamite in the grandson Kish. And, and if, for, your, for you Bible scholars out there, that should ring a bell. Because if you remember, there was another son of Kish of the tribe of, Je of, ben uh, of Benjamin, who we read about all the way back in the book of 1 Samuel, and that was Saul, the first king. Now, the point of this uh, it seems to be two things. First of all, that Mordecai may very well be in that seed line of Saul. Uh, of, of, uh, of Saul. But more, most importantly, the idea that he is a Benjamite who was brought into captivity uh, around the time that Jehoiachin, as we read Jeconiah, is also referred to as Jehoiachin, and also the time of Ezekiel, who was brought into captivity. And we know that um, there's some odd things about that verse, that, that passage, and just to clarify a few things, because your passage may read that Mordecai was carried away from Jerusalem among the captivities. Well, there's a problem with that, because that would make Mordecai about 115 years old. 
Uh, and, and people have gone to this passage and said, well, see, there's a contradiction right there. The, the, they can't get the years right. But, but what we see uh, when you start looking at other translations and, and how the, the, the sentence ought to be rendered, what it appears to be saying is that, his, is that the grandfather of Mordecai, which, which was Kish, was, one, was the one that was among those carried away. So Mordecai's family has been brought into this time of exile which means, means that Mordecai is a man who has been raised in this culture. Uh, he may very well never have lived, in fact, likely never lived in the promised land, and, and there's no indication that he ever goes back. He is a product of the culture in which he lives. And that can probably explain some of the things that we see, as we see Esther uh, being called to go into this harem, and, and Mordecai allows that to happen. Again, it, it's a difficult decision, and obviously there may have been some consequences. But this is a stark contrast when you think about it. When we read about Daniel being introduced back in the book of Daniel, what do we read? Daniel and his friends refused to conform themselves to the culture of the, of the Babylonians. They would not partake of their eat, their meat. They would not defile themselves. They would not bow. They, were, they, they would not forsake the law that they had been, that they had been brought up. Esther is about to be put in a situation where she is going to, to, to violate God's law because she's going to be married to a, to a Gentile. And what we see here is that, that here's another example in the Bible of someone who was in a difficult situation that may not have necessarily made the decision that ought to have been made, but God is going to use that decision for his glory. And Esther, while she, while she may not necessarily, she's not willing to risk her life to refuse this to me, we're going to see that change as we see her own faith grow and her own determination not only to serve God, but to serve her own people. So we see Esther described. And, and from the very beginning, we see somebody who is not only considered beautiful, but is considered someone who is inwardly beautiful. Someone who is gracious, someone who has wisdom, someone who is humble. You see from the very beginning that she is someone who, we're going to read about her listening to Mordecai and doing what he asked her to do. Uh, when her handler advises her to do certain things, she, she takes that advice. She is someone who is, is clearly willing to listen to people and willing to speak to people and deal with people in a very tactful and a very gracious way that makes her appealing, not only to the people around her, but eventually obviously the king, because we read in, in verse 15 through 17 that when she is brought to the king, we see that the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. You know, the, the description that, that we read here is that we're told that when she is brought to the king, it says that she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, uh, advised. It, that you, can, you can contrast this to, to what probably many of the other women were doing. Look, I can have anything I want going to the king. Oh, I want the best dress. I want the best jewels. I want all these things and maybe things that I can take with me when I leave. Uh, I, I wanna, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to get as much as I can. Esther already shows that character and that that's not who she is. She's not looking to capitalize on a situation for her own personal gain. And, and clearly that was visible to the people around her. So she is a woman of great grace, great humility, and great wisdom. And again, it's vital that someone of that nature be put in the position she's going to be in. And so the, the story now has established its main characters. And at this point, and again, the book of Esther is written very much like a narrative. It is a story. It has, it has its protagonist. It has its antagonist. It has its plot. It has its resolution. It uses irony. Uh, it's one of the most ironic books in all the Bible. So ironic that I think a lot of people have, have tried to think that, well, Esther, there's no way Esther could really be a true story because there's no way this could have ever happened. But we see these things playing out. We'll talk about that so as we get into chapter three, or in the latter part of chapter two, the main plot and the main friction of the story is introduced. And it's introduced by, by two actions. And the first one happens in verse, uh, beginning in verse 19, where we read that Mordecai, who is sitting in the king's gate, and by the way, I forgot to mention this, the implication there is not that Mordecai is a beggar sitting by waiting for alms. The implication here is that he's, he's someone of some importance. If you remember, the, the people that were taken into captivity back in Second Kings are described as those who were of value, those who were either brought into the king's court or the king's service. They were artisans, they were craftsmen, they were people of skill. 
And it's very likely that Mordecai's family probably was in some service to the king. And it appears that after the, the, the kingdom transitioned over from Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire, that that continued to be the case. And Mordecai, although he is not, uh, he is hiding the fact that he is a Jew, continues to enjoy some sort of access and some sort of service, uh, service to the king. So he's sitting in the gate, and in that context, we learn that he learns about an attempt against the king's life in verse 21 to 23. And we see that, uh, and this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, he told it to Queen Esther. Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the books of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now that's going to be important later on. The idea that, well, Mordecai did this great thing and we're going to write it down, but we're not really going to, there's no indication that anything was ever really done for him. And the next thing that we read in chapter one, chapter three, verse one, it says that after these things, King Azaghirus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. Now, so now we're introduced to the conflict. And it starts off with the idea of Mordecai versus Haman. And it's going to, we're going to see very clearly that this conflict is, is going to symbolize something much greater than that. That we're going to see Haman, who is constantly referred to in this book as the enemy, the enemy of our people. There's a constant reference to those who hate the Jews, those who are the enemies of God's people. Uh, and it becomes very clear that Haman is not only an enemy personally to Mordecai, but he is an enemy and a symbol of all of those who are seeking the destruction of and it's kind of interesting, the way he is introduced suggests an even greater symbolism because he's, just, he's described as an Agagite. And I said a little bit better. And again, as we talked about, if you remember the, the, the connection with Saul, you probably remember the connection of, with Agag. Because Agag, if we remember back in the days of Saul, was the king, uh, was the king of the Amorites, who were considered in all points probably one of, one of Israel's greatest uh, uh, enemies. Uh, they had opposed them from the very beginning. They were the ones who had come out, even when Israel was trying to enter into Canaan and pass by, they came out and attacked Israel to begin with. They were constantly a thorn in the side so much so that when, when, when Saul is king, God sends word through Samuel telling him, I have noted what Amalek did to, the Israel, to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they had. And of course we know the story. Saul didn't do that. He spared them. Uh, Agag is killed by Samuel, and eventually, it, it, the assumption is that in First Chronicles four, there's references to the remnant of the Amalekites being destroyed by the by the, uh, the tribe of Simeon, which appears to have happened sometime in the in the in the time of Hezekiah. It's not really important, but the idea is that this group had essentially been, if not extinguished, then pretty much extinguished by the Jewish people. And, and whether the writer here is intending to tell us that Haman is actually a descendant of Agag. And a descendant, and he is in fact an Amalekite, it's unclear. But what is clear is that whether he is literally a descendant, he is clearly spiritually a descendant. He is someone who is going to oppose Israel. And it seems pretty clear that there is already a predisposition against the Jewish people to begin with in his attitude. And all of those things together, combined with the fact that this man has now been promoted above Mordecai, may explain what happens in the rest of this chapter. Because what we see now is that once Haman is honored, it says in verse two that all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. And the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's word would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So, and it may very well be that the refusal here is the idea that I am a Jew, and as a Jew, I am not allowed to, to kneel or bow before any man. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, because we see examples of the, the Jews. They bowed to their king. Uh, they, they gave homage, and they, they praised uh, earthly kings on a number of other instances. So I don't know that that's necessarily what's going on. But as we start to learn more about Haman, it's, it's reasonable to assume, I think, that Mordecai knew who Haman was. And he knew the person that Haman was. And it seems as if what he's saying from the very beginning is that I will not kneel before a man of his quality. I will not kneel before someone who is as corrupt and as evil as this man is. Maybe that's a lesson for us today. Maybe, maybe the idea that we are, we are to respect our leaders, for certainly. 
But there is a big difference between following and respecting and obeying the civil powers and turning around and then glorifying and exalting someone who is not deserving of that honor. Isn't that something we ought to keep in mind? So we see in this story, again, this, this, this rivalry that is set up, and we see how angry it makes Mordecai. And it says in verse 5 that when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, so they might, uh, the, so as, as they made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Again, the writer now makes sure that we understand that now we're not just talking about a feud between two men. We're now talking about the very fate of God's people. Because Haman has now decided to commit, gen decided to commit genocide. And, and as we read this story, we see that Haman... And his advisors, day by day, cast lots to determine a day and a month when this is going to take place. And once they decide that, in Esther chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, Haman then goes to King Ahasuerus. And he says, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the province of our kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate. He that pleased the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they might put it into the king's treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the, the enemy of the Jews. Esther is going to use this language later on in the book that we have been sold. Uh, we have been sold into destruction. You know, this, the, the idea of Haman paying 10,000 talents that, that's an insane amount of money. And it speaks to the desperation with, with which Haman is looking at this, the desire to, to, to wipe out this entire people because of this slot. And it also explains a little bit why the king was willing to do it, because 10,000 talents was an amazing amount of money. And he's willing to do that. And again, you know, this is not actually, we, again, the, the critics of this book will say, well, this is on, there, there's no way he would have just wiped out an entire people. But we actually have records of, of the Persian Empire when genocide was attempted for, for various reasons uh, uh, related to revolts by a specific people that the response was to wipe out everybody. Uh, this is not a, a stretch to say that this is something that, that Xerxes would have been willing to do. And so we see the word going, into, uh, going, into, going out to all the provinces. Uh, and again, not just into Babylon. We're talking about the Jewish people who were already established back in Jerusalem. The temple has already been built. They're still trying to kind of rebuild their civilization, and now they get word that, by the way, the Persians who have allowed us to come back here are now going to wipe us out. And we see the result uh, throughout the kingdom of the Jews mourning and fasting, and of course this includes Mordecai. Uh, he begins mourning, he dons sackcloth, out, sackcloth outside the king's gate, and the news eventually comes to Esther. She hears that he's doing this, and, and again, Esther's the queen, but we, we learned later on that she hadn't seen the king in about 30 days. She's been king at, queen at this point for about five years. And it may very well be that the, it's the metaphorical ro bloom is off the rose, that now the king has kind of moved on and, and he's kind of doing other things and he's no longer as infatuated with the queen as he used to be. And so he, he just hasn't talked to her. So it's not unreasonable to think that she hasn't heard about any of this until she hears that Mordecai is upset. Well, what's going on? So she sends messages from her servants to him. And what she learns is, is all that has happened, that the people are going to be killed. And that leads into, uh, in chapter four, where, where Mordecai gives the speech that I think we all associate with this book. The, the, the statement that we all remember down, uh, down in verse eight through 16, Mordecai tells them, uh, tells the servant to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the, from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this becomes a pretty important part of the story because, again, to this point, I think we've seen Esther as someone who was relatively passive in nature, who was willing to kind of go along and to not make waves and to try to do her best to kind of fly under the radar. But we see the change here. Because Esther hears this and understands that he's right. That now's the time for me to do something. And so she says, go and gather all the Jews to be found in Sisa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. And then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. 
So Esther changes her approach, but, but we don't see Esther changing her character. I think it's useful to see that Esther is the same person she was before. She, she is still gracious, she is still tactful, she is still kind, she is still wise in the way that she approaches these things. And it's really interesting to watch how she engineers this. And again, we're not gonna go through, we, we could probably spend a lot of time to read all the details, but we see that Esther goes to the king, uh, she puts her life in her hands to go without being summoned, the king sees her and is pleased with her. And she invites him to a feast. And she makes sure to invite Haman too. And it may well be that what she's doing now is making sure that Haman is not uh, suspicious about something, that Haman doesn't think that something is up. Uh, she makes sure that he is included as well. And so he comes with the king and he's feeling very good about himself. And, and it's here where we start to see the story kind of shift towards Haman and we start to learn a little bit about the kind of person that Haman is. Because as Haman is coming back, he's just been to the, 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 the first dinner that will precede the second dinner. And he's going home and he's thinking about, man, I am, the, I am really great. Look at all that I have. Look at all that I've been exalted to. I am the most important person next to the king. The queen even invites me. And yet look at what Mordecai's doing. And he gathers his friends and he talks about all the great things about himself and all his life. And he says, yet all of this is worth nothing to me as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's table. Many sermon. Have we known anybody like this? I have so many things in my life, so many good things, so many things that God has blessed me with, but it doesn't mean anything because that person over there has wronged me and I can't let it go. I can't get past the, the bitterness in my mind the bitterness in my heart, and it's ruining my life. See, that exactly is what happened to Haman. The sad thing is we see it happen to our brothers and sisters sometimes. We see divisions in the church. We see people who allow their personal grudges to become so ingrained in their lives and so bitter and so angry that they forfeit their souls. Brother, that should never be. We see the example, maybe in, a, in an exaggerated sense, in what happens to Haman here, because Haman's downfall is directly resulted to of his pride, of his anger, of his bitterness. It is his downfall. We'll talk about that a little bit at, at, at the close. And Haman's wife and his friends, they see this. And of course, again, we, we see a lot of poor advisors in the Bible. This is an example of it because they say, well, there's an easy fix for your problem. Just build a gallows that's, that's visible from anywhere in the city and hang Haman on it and everything will be burned. He says, okay, I'm gonna do that. That's a great idea. And so here again, we see one of the great ironic turns in the story because it happens that as he goes to the king, he finds the king having stayed up all night because the king couldn't sleep. And the king is going back to those archives, those records that we alluded to a while back. And he has read the story of what Mordecai did. And he's, he's thinking to himself, you know, we should have done something for this guy. And he asks the question, what was, what was done for this man? This is nothing is and so he, see, he hears that Haman has come in and he says, okay, I'm going to ask Haman about this. Haman will know what to do. And so in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 5 and 12, we read that Haman comes in. And the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man who the king delights to honor, what royal robes we brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Just a context for us. Here's a man who just offered to pay 10,000 talents to the king. He's wealthy beyond imagination. Here's a man who is second only to the king, the second most important to the king, the second most important in all the king. There is literally nothing else that can be done for him except what he describes here. The only way I could be honored is to receive this. And the king responds, that shall it be done. The king says to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horses you have said and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. And we see Haman doing this. And it says that after Mordecai returned to the gate, Haman hurried to his house mourning with his head covered. But things only get worse because that same day, that same hour almost, the, the servants are, are, are call are call him to come to the to the queen's uh, the queen's second dinner. And it's at this dinner that Queen Esther makes her request known to to uh, 
to the king. And she describes in a much different language than what Haman said. If you notice, she says, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, it would have been, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. So no longer, she makes the point, first of all, I'm not trying to impose anything on you. I, I, I understand, I'm not going to take anything away from you, but you need to understand what's really going on here. And she makes the point, and by doing so, and by associating and attaching herself to this, this is no longer some anonymous attack on some anonymous group of people out there that are rebels and and probably not doing any good and and would would be best to get rid of them. Now this is an attack on the queen. And by definition, it's an attack on the king. It's an attack on the palace. And so we see King Ahasuerus' attitude changes dramatically. You know, sometimes I think we, we, we sometimes look at this as him just kind of changing his mind because Esther told him the same thing. But in reality, Esther is giving him a much truer version of what's going on. And having heard the truth, Ahasuerus rightly feels betrayed by what Haman did. He says, who is he? And where is he? And who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and an enemy. This wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And we see Haman, by his own actions, by his own guile, by his own bitterness, going from the most honored man in the kingdom to begging for his life before the queen. Kind of an ironic twist. Now, first it was Esther begging for her life, and yet now it's Haman begging for his life. But where she did it with grace, he does it with clumsiness, and anger and fear to the point that he even violates decorum to the point when the king walks in and sees in verse 8 through 10, the king returning from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, well, he even assault the queen in my presence in my house. And the word, as the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the eunuchs and attendants on the king said, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house. You get the idea Haman was not particularly well liked. You got a servant that, oh, by the way, if you want to kill him, hey, here's an idea. He just built some gals for Haman, for, for Mordecai. And the king said, hang him on that. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. And it says in chapter 8, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told him what he was uh, what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. This is, it's not the final victory, but you start to see the language that the writer is using here to say that this is not just Mordecai over Haman. This is God's people being triumphant over their enemies. This is the promise that has been given to us in the scripture that said that God has chosen us, that God will redeem us, that God will bless us, and that God will conquer our enemies. This is all the Psalms that we have read all, the, all the, the, the predictions and the cries out to God that he will protect his holy people, all being fulfilled before our eyes. But the issue isn't settled yet. They, they still have to deal with Haman's edict. Uh, and again, as we talked about, the king does not reverse his ruling, but what he does do is allow Mordecai to write his own edict, which allows the Jews to defend themselves. And in verse 10 through 11, we read that the king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan on the 23rd day. By the way, this is the same year that the, 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 the deaths were supposed to take place, but they're going to take place in the 12th month. So we're in the third month of this, which is the month of Sivan on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors, the officials. Uh, and goes on to say, he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted courier riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force for any people or province that might attack them. Now in the 12th month, in verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, which is the month of Adar, the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. We see Esther appealing to the king to even allow a second day of retaliation as a result of that. Some 75,000 people were killed throughout the kingdom, but none of them were the Jews. 
because God remembered, because God delivered. As we think about some of the stories that we've read and some of the things that theme, the, the themes, it's been rightly pointed out that God is never mentioned by name in this story. And yet God's actions are undeniable. You know, we talked about this before. One of the main reasons that people often reject this book as being a true story is because there's just no way it can be true. There's just no way that these events could line up as perfectly as they do. And yet what we see is that this is not the first time that God has used men and women, uh, put them in the right place at the right time, and made sure that they were there for the benefit of God's people. You know, we see this example all, all, all throughout the Bible. We see Joseph. We see Moses, and now we see Esther. Just a few of the examples of people that God places for the good of his people and for the fulfillment of his will. We see a trust that is evident in the way that people, in the way that people approach uh, what is going to happen. And I was just I was thinking about this. You know, they had to do it in a very different way. You know, during, during the time of, of, of David, we saw not necessarily miraculous things, but such dramatic feats of strength and ability by men who were imbued with the Spirit of God. We see the prophets later on who were able to manifest great powers before the people to prove who they were. None of, that, none of that's in existence anymore. These people had to rely on their faith. They didn't even have the temple anymore. If you remember over in 1 Kings, the, the, the statement that Solomon makes when he dedicates the temple, the encouragement that he gives and the, 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 the request he makes of God when they, talking about his people, when they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin, and you were angry with them and hand them over to the enemy and their captors deport them to the enemy's country, wherever, whether distant or nearby. And when they come to their senses in the land where they were deported and repent and petition you in their captors' lands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked. And when they return to you with all their hearts and all their souls in the land of their enemies who took them captive, and when they pray to you in the direction of their land, that you gave their ancestors the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name. May you hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and petition, and uphold their cause. May you forgive your people who sinned against you and all their rebellions against you. And may you grant them compassion before their captors so that they may treat them compassionately. Does that, it sounds exactly what we're reading here, isn't it? But despite the fact that the temple is gone, despite the fact that there's no evidence of, of miraculous things going on, it's impossible not to ignore the amazing evidences and examples of providence we see and how many things have to happen. Think about the idea that, you know, first of all, even Esther's appointment to the Jewish leaders, uh, the, the Jewish leaders place to, pres uh, to preserve God's people, the idea that Daniel was there, that, that Mordecai was there, that Esther was there, that there was this influence that was available to the king to work on, on God's people's behalf. Even something like Haman casting lots. You know, the, the lots, what, what if the lots had fallen on the first month? What if they'd fallen on the third month? But they fell on the 12th month, which means there was more than enough time for people to prepare themselves. They were able to overcome uh, the obstacles that were put in front of them. We see the reaction, we didn't read about, the, but the reaction of the governor and the people throughout the provinces, when they hear this ruling, when they say that Mordecai is now in charge and Mordecai is giving the Jews license to fight back, and, and the, the, the conclusion that these people come, for, come to is that we need to be helping the Jews out as well. And we see overwhelmingly the leaders in those areas coming to the defense of the Jews and adding their resources. And all of a sudden, the people that wanted to kill the Jews are, are now in the minority. All through the providence of God. The, the reaction of the governors and the people who, who side with the Jews and are, are fearful of the Jews as a result of that, they're delivered. We see the king not being able to sleep the night before Haman's visit. You know, that sounds like a great literary device. And it, it makes for great irony. But when it's true, we see providence of God in action, making sure that everything happens exactly the way it needs to happen and exactly the time it needs to happen for God's people to be delivered. It's the same kind of faith that we see, for example, in the book of Ezra, over in Ezra 8, 21 through 23, when, when Ezra is leading the people back. And remember what he says in verse 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that he might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king 
The hand of our God is for good on all who seek it. And the power of his wrath is against all who forsake it. So we fasted and implored our God for this. And he listened to our entreaty. You know, we see the same fasting going on not only in Susa, but in all the provinces as the people fasted and mourned. And, and it's never said that they prayed, but very clearly when we see in Ezra and Nehemiah, when Nehemiah also fasted, that these are associated with times of prayer, supplication to God. And we know that God hears those prayers and those fasts and those appeals for help. And God's providence is revealed, as we talked about, through his non-action. The things that he doesn't do, but the things that when we start looking at them all together are inexplicable any other way. And we see this pattern again of God able to use human action for his will and for his purpose. You know, it's one of the great themes in the Bible is this idea of the ironic punishment of the wicked. And we, it doesn't happen all the time. We wish it would, or at least we don't always see it. But we see in the Psalms, for example, in Psalm 7, 14 through 16, behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit in digging it out and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head. The idea of uh, down in 520, uh, Proverbs 5, 22 through 23, where the proverb writer writes, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. He is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. And we, we read the perfect example of this playing out here in the story of Haman. But the overall purpose of this, in the overall message, even though God is never mentioned in the story, is that God remembers the sojourners. He remembers us even when we're not where we ought to be. Even when we're far away. Even when we're removed. Even when we're in a nation, in a world that is not ours. Not to give us comfort. Because we're in the same situation. We're raised in a culture that is not ours living in a world that rejects everything that we stand for, living in a world that denies God, and we don't belong here. And if we do belong here, we need to be thinking about that a little bit. Because this world is not our home. We're described in 1 Peter 2.12, says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Isn't that exactly what we just read in the New Testament? That's what we see. Godly people having an influence in the world around them because of their godliness, because of their righteousness, because of their willingness to do whatever they need to do to serve God at all costs. Esther and Mordecai are our example. Just one of many that we read in the Bible. And we think about how we approach God today. Do we pray with the same humility that they pray? Do we, do we repent of our sins? Do we look to God knowing that we're sinful, knowing that we don't deserve it, but we know that there's been a promise made that God will deliver us if we will turn to him? Are we willing to do that? Do we, do we see ourselves not as instruments to do our own will, not as instruments to get what we want, but instruments to perform God's will every day? Do we see ourselves in that light? And do we trust God's promise that if we will do these things, that God will deliver us? Maybe he won't do it in the way that we want him to do it. Maybe that deliverance doesn't look the way we would like it to look. But we know that God is faithful because God is working, even when we don't see it. One of the great passages in all the Bible is over in 2 Kings chapter 6 and the story of Elisha as the, the king, of, uh, king of Syria has decided that he's had enough with Elisha interfering with his plans and he sends the armies to go get him and take him into captivity. And, and the servant that is with him hears about, he looks out the window and, and Elijah is sitting in the house and the, 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 the hillside is, the whole city is surrounded by the, 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 the armies of the Syrians and he, and he asks, what are we going to do? And in verse 16, Elisha says, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, all the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around the nation. And none of them had to, you notice that none of them had to raise a sword. None of them had to fight, but they were there. They were there in protection. They were there in providence to ensure that God's will would be done. In Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, the writer says that he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do? 
So the lesson is yours this morning. Hopefully it's been useful again as we, as we think about this story and think about the examples of faith and the examples of courage that we see throughout the Bible, and particularly in this story as well. That we would have this courage and the strength to do exactly what we need to do, to be instruments of God's will, not for our own good, but for the good of God's people and for the good of God's word and for his glory on this life and for the hope and life to come. Thank you for your attention, for your appreciation, uh, for your attendance, and for your, for your patience. We probably went a little bit long, but uh, hopefully it was useful for all of us. At this time, we're going to be led in a, in a song, uh, and then we will have the Lord's Supper, uh, and then we'll consider ourselves to